with me. How many of you know that? Just tell him, I'm in love with Jesus. There you go, you got it. He loves you. he loves you. Just say, I'm in love with you. Just lift up your voices and worship him. I'm in love with Jesus. Oh God, I love you. And he's in love with me. I know he loves me and I know he loves I'm each and every one of you. And he's in love with me. Just this last time, everybody, everybody. I'm in love with Jesus. Come on and he's in love. He's in love with me. I'm in love. Oh 
love you. I love you, Lord, today because you cared for me in such a special way. That's why I praise you. I lift you up and I magnify your name. That's why my heart is filled with praise. Oh Lord, I love you. I love you. I love you, Lord, today because you cared for me in such a special way. That's why I praise you. I lift you up. I magnify, magnify your name. That's why my heart, oh, that's why my heart is filled. Oh, that's why my heart is filled with praise. Hallelujah. Salvation and glory. Honor and power unto the Lord our God. For the Lord our God is mighty. Yes, the Lord our God is omnipotent. The Lord our God, He is wonderful. All praises be to the King. the Lord our God He is wonderful all praises be to the Lord 
Father, Lord, we come to you now as we prepare to open your word. Lord, I pray that you speak to our hearts today. Lord, we sense your presence here today. Lord, we pray as we open your word, Lord, that we would see you high and lifted up. May we be transformed by you today. In Jesus' name. Amen. 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 My heart is so full. I, yeah. <laughs> no place like the Stratford Memorial Church. <laughs> Not too many places where you can just let the spirit lead. Mm. Mm. Come on now. Well, in October this year, I was <laughs> watching television and a Target commercial came across the television screen. And the whole time I realized, I started thinking to myself, in the, in the middle of the commercial, I started thinking about Christmas. But there was nothing in the commercial that had absolutely anything to do with Christmas, at least what I could see. But as I began to listen more closely and as the, <laughs> the commercial was coming to an end, I could hear in the background Christmas bells ringing. And I thought to myself, they are messing with my subconscious mind. <laughs> All the way in October, without saying Christmas, they were already signaling to me that it was Christmas time. And more importantly, they were signaling to me to make sure that I start making plans to spend my money. <laughs> I got a little upset when I thought about that. I said, I can't believe they're, they're actually doing this to me. But today, I want to talk to you about, you know, the world in this time talks about ways in which we can give the perfect gift and spend our money. There's nothing wrong with giving gifts. But I want to talk to you today of how we make plans to make room for Christ in our heart and why that is so important. In a sermon entitled simply, <laughs> Make Room. All right now. I want you to turn with me to the book of Luke chapter 2. The book of Luke chapter 2, and I want to read in your hearing starting in verse 1 through 7. And I'll read from the New King James Version of the Bible, Luke chapter 2, starting in verse 1. Still here a few pages. And it came to pass in those days that a decree went out from Caesar Augustus that all the world should be registered. This census first took place while Quirinius was governing Syria. So all went to be registered, everyone to his own city. Joseph also went up from Galilee, out of the city of Nazareth, into Judea, to the city of David, which is called Bethlehem, because he was of the house and the lineage of David to be registered with Mary, his betrothed wife, who was with child. So it was that while they were there, the days were completed for her to be delivered. And she brought forth her firstborn son and wrapped him in swaddling cloths and laid him in a manger because there was no room for them in the inn. By the time that Mary and Joseph arrive through the gates of Bethlehem, they are tired and worn. For since leaving Nazareth, they've been traveling approximately 85 miles. Now, as they make their way through the crowded and congested streets of the city and search for a place to lay their head, they are unable to find a single place for them to stay. They travel in vain all the way to the other side of the city, other side of the town, in hopes of finding a place to rest for the night, but their efforts prove to be fruitless. All the guest rooms, all of the 
reserved for travelers, the Airbnbs and bread and breakfasts are all filled to capacity. Even the main public shelter where travelers would gather for the night is packed to maximum capacity. You see, everyone was gathered in Bethlehem. Every person alive that was born in Bethlehem, Bethlehem had to come to the city to register in response to Caesar Augustus's decree to make sure that they were counted so that nobody would be overlooked at tax time. And so because of this, you have an influx of people into the city of Bethlehem to where there is nowhere to stay and people can barely make their way through Bethlehem Street. And this is the reason why the Bible says, records, that there was no room in Bethlehem. There was no place in the entire village able or ready to receive the soon-to-be-born Savior of the world. They finally had to settle, Mary and Joseph, for a lodging in the lowliest of places. It is believed that they stayed in the lower level of the room or stall for animals um, attached to the living quarters of a private residence. Some believe that it was a cave used to used for shelter for animals, and others believe that it was a feeding place under the open sky, probably in the middle of the town square. As fate would have it, in the fulfillment of Bible prophecy, Mary comes to full term, and the long-awaited Messiah is finally born. And Mary, with the tenderest love and care, swaddles Jesus in strips of cloth to keep him warm and to keep his limbs straight so that they can grow properly. And the Bible says that she laid him in a manger, which really is a nice way of saying that they lay him in a narrow, in a long, narrow, open container used for animals to eat and drink out of. It is called a feeding trough. And we begin to look at Jesus' birth and where, his, where he comes, and we can't help but think what an amazing condescension and a display and a remarkable display of humi humility and submission. Jesus is willing to submit himself to the care and protection of his earthly mother whom he created. He is even willing to allow himself to be placed in a food and water container that is reserved for animals to eat. Can you imagine the savior of the world, the king of the universe coming to a place where he's born and he doesn't even literally have a place to lay his head? And the only place that will receive him in all of Bethlehem is an animal stall. He comes to the lowest place. And the only place that has room. And notice, my brothers and sisters, that Jesus' birth is not revealed to a single person in the city of Bethlehem. No one even knows that he is there. Instead, Jesus is revealed to a group of shepherds in the field on the outskirts of the city who are at the bottom of the social ladder. They are poor. They have no power. They have no status. They have no influence. But most importantly, they have room in their hearts. I want to read verses 8 through 12 in Luke chapter 2. And it says, Now there were in the same country shepherds living out in the fields, keeping watch over their flock by night. 
And behold, an angel of the Lord stood before them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were greatly afraid. Then the angel said to them, Do not be afraid, for behold, I bring you good tidings of great joy, which will be to all people. For there is born to you this day in the city of David a Savior who is Christ the Lord, and this will be the sign to you. You will find a babe wrapped in swaddling cloths, lying in a manger. Unlike those living in the gates of Bethlehem who don't just have room in their houses and room in their inns, but it is symbolic of the reality that they also do not have room in their hearts. And so Jesus, even though he's there, he cannot be revealed to them because they are too preoccupied with their own pursuits and their own concerns. You see, my brothers and sisters, brothers and sisters, Jesus can only reveal himself to the meek and the lowly of heart. In other words, Jesus can only reveal himself to the heart that is willing to be submitted to his will in the same way that he is willing to be submitted to his father's will. Oh, you're not with me today. Jesus, it was not Jesus' will to come and be born in a feeding trough or in a manger. That was his father's will. But he was so humble, so submissive to his father's will that he was willing to submit himself to the father's will. And when we have a heart that is willing to be submitted and yielded to the will of God, then Jesus is able to reveal himself to us, and what a glorious revelation it is. Look what happens in the verse, starting in verse 13, and after the pronouncement, Helen White, in talking about this story, Inspired Pen, says that, that angels were behind the mountains waiting in anticipation for Jesus to be born. They could not wait to come from behind the shadows and allow their glory to be seen so that they could announce and proclaim the coming of the Savior to the world. And because these shepherds have humble and submissive hearts, they're able to see the revelation of God in the Son of Jesus Christ and the glory of God. Notice what happens. And suddenly there was, in the, there was with the angel a multitude of heavenly hosts praising God, meaning that there was a myriad. There were thousands of angels in the sky, sky that night. And they burst out. They're so, they're so jubilant. They're so excited because they know what's getting ready to happen that they sing glory to God in the highest. And on earth, peace and goodwill toward all men. So it was when the angels had gone away from them into heaven that the shepherds said to one another, let us now go to Bethlehem and see this thing that has come to pass, which the Lord has made known to us. And they came with haste and found Mary and Joseph and the baby lying in a manger. You have to have a submissive heart to the will of God to believe that the king of the universe will be found in a stall full of animals. But because they have believing hearts, they're able to see the angels and the glory of God in the eastern sky. And they make their way all the way to Bethlehem to see Jesus Christ. It is interesting that early in verse 12, um, I'm sorry, in verse 12 it says, and this will be a sign to you. It is interesting that Jesus' sign of power is revealed in weakness. This is in contrast to Caesar Augustus, who, who through political and military maneuvering gained power and was thought to believe to be a God on earth, to be the savior of the world. That's what he was believed and what he was proclaimed to be. But yet he rules with coercion and force. But Jesus comes in power, in humility and weakness, and the demonstration of his strength is seen in his security to be become a little baby in a manger. 
submitted to the will of God. Ready to yield himself to him. How difficult this is for many of us when it comes to submitting to the will of God. Hmm? Hmm? There's something in our nature that causes us to always want to be in control of ourselves and our lives. Hmm? Story in 1986 in the Black Sea right off the coast of of Russia that there was a horrible um, accident. Two ships collided with one another and hundreds of people died and were thrown into the cold sea. But what shocked everybody in the investigation, what really made it worse, was that they discovered that the reason for the accident was not because there was anything technologically wrong with any of the ships. There was nothing wrong with the radar detector. There was no malfunction, nor they discovered was it because of fog, not because they, they did not see each other. But what they discovered was that each captain on both, on both ships saw one another, but decided that they were too stubborn to steer clear of one another. They were too proud to yield to the other person. And by the time they came to their senses, it was too late. And many of us are slow to yield when it comes to submitting to God. And if we do not recognize our need for Christ and learn how to yield to him, our life to him, then there will come a time when it will be too late. Then he will be unable to reveal himself to us. Hear me now. Here's what's at stake in our inability to, to, to yield to God is that we're not able to really see him in the fullness of who he is. But even more importantly, when we're not willing to be yielded to the will of God, no matter what that is, then Christ's life cannot be formed inside of us. Oh, well, you're not with me today. You see, many of us, we're into partial yielding. Hmm. I will yield in this area and in this area. This is easy to do. This is comfortable, but we're not interested in complete submission to Jesus Christ. And sometimes we think because I'm submitted to him in this area that he will excuse my lack of submission in this area. But in order for Christ to be truly revealed, in order for him to be formed inside of our hearts, we have to be willing to be submitted to his will in every area. And if this doesn't happen, we cannot enter into the kingdom of God or experience the power of the kingdom while we wait for the consummation of his eternal kingdom. What many of us don't understand is that this is the goal of Christ's coming. Here's why he came. He came not only so that he could save us from our sins, but he came so that he could be formed in us. That's why he came. Hmm? Now, let's look, at, um, look here a little bit early in Luke chapter 1. I want to explain this a little bit more. Luke chapter 1, verse 30 and 31. And what we see here, what we discover, what we discover here is when the angel shows up to Mary's doorsteps of her heart. And notice what he says. And I'm kind of, let me, let me just start in 26. Now, in the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent by God to a city of Galilee named Nazareth to a virgin betrothed to a man whose name was Joseph of the house of David. The virgin's name was Mary. And having come in, the angel said to her, Rejoice, highly favored one. The Lord is with you. Blessed are you among women. But then, but when she saw him, she was troubled at his saying and considered what manner of greeting this was. Verse 30. Then the angel said, Do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God. And behold, you will conceive in your womb and bring forth a son, and he shall call and, can, and shall call his name Jesus. So here we see the pronouncement is that Christ would come within. But how does Christ come within? 
She asked the very same question in verse 35. And, and then Mary, the verse 34, Mary said, then Mary said to an angel, how can this be since I do not know a man? And the angel answered and said to her, the Holy Spirit will come upon you and the power of the Most High will overshadow you, overshadow you. Therefore, also, that Holy One who is to be born will be called the Son of God. In other words, the only way that Jesus can come into our lives and be born inside of us is for the Holy Spirit to do it. It is not something that we can do on our own, and it is something that is of a supernatural proportions. Only Jesus can do it, and he does it through the power of his Holy Spirit. But we notice something else in her response to what she was saying, which stands in direct contrast to, to, to earlier in the book um, in the pronouncement to Zacharias. Look at verse 38. Then Mary said, Behold the maidservant of the Lord, let it be to me according to your word. And the angel departed from her. And what we notice here is that as unbelievable as it is that God would choose her and put the Savior of the world inside of her womb, she says in verse 38, let it be according to your word. She takes God at his word. She is willing to be yielded to him in every area of her life. Now, this stands in, in direct contrast, as you mentioned, to Zacharias, who was the father of John the Baptist. When the angel showed up to him, he could not believe what the angel was saying. And so the angel caused him to not be able to speak. But what is interesting is that Zacharias was a priest. He was in the temple worshiping God when the angel shows up, but he does not believe what the angel says to him. But here is Mary, who is the most unlikely person for the Savior of the world to be born. But because she has a heart for God that is open and willing and submissive and pliable, God is able to reveal himself to her. See, sometimes we think the more religious we are, the more perfect we are that we have to be in order for God to reveal himself to us. And we see that that is not so. What is needed is a heart that is willing to be yielded by, yielded to the leading of God. This is the goal of Christ's ministry. In, in Galatians it says, Paul says, I'm in birth pains until Christ be formed in you. In other words, it's not enough just to profess faith in Jesus Christ. But the true evidence, the true demonstration that you know him is revealed in your life that reveals his character. And what we see in the character of Jesus Christ is condescension, giving up power, selflessness, self-sacrifice, humility. That's how we know if Christ has been formed in us. And Mary is not chosen because she's so holy, because she's perfect, but because she is humble. Hmm? How many of you want Christ to be formed in you? That's why Jesus came, to save us and to sanctify us. And the only way that we can have the same experience as the shepherd in the field and as Mary is to have a heart that is willing to be yielded to God like Jesus was yielded to God. Think about that for a moment. The king of the universe leaves heaven and becomes a baby. No, he, become, he becomes a fetus in the womb. Then he is born. He's not even fully aware who he is. It's not until he gets older that it comes to the realization that he's the Messiah of the world. He comes and his entire life he walks in submission to the will of his father. And when he finally grows up, even then when he becomes aware that he's the Savior, he still walks in submission to the will of the father. He does nothing on his own accord or his own initiation. He says, I only do what I see my father doing. 
And I want to suggest to you today, my brothers and sisters, that this is the kind of life, the type of intimacy that God wants us to have with him. A life of submission, yielded to him. It is the only way that we can really see him. Story of a, a man in Britain who was a great musician and he was celebrating his 100th year birthday and all of the British aristocrats came to his 100th year celebration. And one lady there by the name of Lady Diana, she comes and she sits at the table and she's having um, a wonderful conversation with this lady that obviously knows her very well. But because she has, her eyesight is failing, she is not able to really recognize the person that she's talking to. And so she's having a great conversation, but it begins to dawn on her that this person must know who I am. And so she kind of peers a little bit closer. She gets closer to the lady. And to her surprise, she has been talking to the Queen of England all this time. And she's embarrassed. She says, oh, my, oh, ma'am, I'm so sorry. I did not recognize you without your crown. And then the queen says, she says, well, today was Robert, Sir Robert's day. And so I didn't want to take away any attention. So I left my crown at home. And because she left her crown at home, the lady didn't recognize her. She had to get close to see her. And I want to suggest to you that when Jesus came in Bethlehem, he didn't come with a crown. And only the people that were willing to lean in and get close were able to see him. Later in the book of Luke, he says that the kingdom of God comes not through observation, meaning it doesn't come with great display of power. It's not in the tangible signs. He says the kingdom of God is hidden. It comes. It's within you. And only the person who has the heart to know God will be able to recognize the coming of God. See, Jesus comes and he is often hidden. But the sincere heart is able to recognize him. And so today, so today, I don't know about you, Jesus is getting ready to come. And he's moving today. He's moving every day. Revealing himself. And it's not in a big, fantastic display. You know, I'm reminded of Elijah, you know the story of Elijah? Comes off of Mount Carmel, fire down from heaven. <laughs> hmm? And then he's depressed in the valley because he hears that Jezebel's going to kill him. Hmm? So you can be on fire for God one day. He can use you mightily <laughs> hmm? and be down in the dumps the next day. But when he was in the cave, the Lord came, told him to step outside. And he saw a fire, was thunder. He says, I'm not in any of those things. I'm in a, a still, a still small voice that only the careful, listening, humble ear will be able to hear. Hmm? See, we like to be moved by our emotions. Hmm? If it doesn't get us into tears or our emotions on 10, then we have not met Jesus. But here we see that Jesus moves imperceptibly, silently. And only the humble heart, the heart willing to do all that he says, will hear him. If you're looking for him in the crowd, you might miss him. Hmm? If you're looking for him where everybody is, that doesn't mean he, it could be everybody, they could be saying his name, and it doesn't mean he is there. Yes, yes, yes. The humble heart. So I'm going to pray today. I'm going to pray. 
that Christ will give us all humble hearts so that we might see the glory of God, that we might experience the fullness of him, that his life might be born in us just like his life was born into Mary's life through the Holy Spirit. May his character be formed in us. That's our prayer. Father, oh Lord, we pray that you come and fill us today. Give us humble hearts. Lord, I pray that you tear away the stubbornness, our unwillingness to yield. All of those things that cause us not to make room for you. Many of us are preoccupied with our lives and all the things that we're doing. And we don't have room for Jesus. But we see here today that the way to make room for you to come is to be willing to submit to you in every area of our lives. Lord, that is the only way that we can come to know you and see you and experience the fullness of your power and your love. And so, Lord, give us hearts to see today. Give us humble hearts. This is our prayer. In Jesus' name. Amen. 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 God bless you. I'd be remiss if I didn't make an appeal today. Hmm. Anybody here today? Maybe you've never given your heart to Jesus. Hmm. You've never given him the okay to come inside. And today you heard him speaking to you. And you want to receive him into your heart. You want to say, Lord, I want to say yes to your will. Are you here today? If you're here, I want you to raise your hand. If you want to be baptized, if you want to come to know him, are you here today? Anybody here? Anybody here? God bless you. God bless you. Many people have heard about Jesus. Some have believed that he was a good man. Others that he was a prophet. Still others that was, he was the founder of a new religion. Jesus has shaped this planet and has changed the life on it in a remarkable way. He has influenced it more than all armies that ever march, all kings and rulers that ever reign, and all inventions that were ever made. He left his commandment of love, his exemplary life, and above all, he has saved us. Please stand as we offer a word of prayer in closing. Now unto him who is able to keep us from stumbling and to present you faultless before the presence of his glory with exceeding joy to God our Savior who alone is wise be glory and majesty dominion and power both now and forever amen please be seated
us, Stratford family, you are dismissed. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you.